Welcome to Tools for Time Traveling, the podcast equipping creators to build the future today. Because the future isn't something that just happens to you, it's built by creators of all stripes. Every episode, we'll talk to a creative industry expert to get a behind the curtains look at the past and present of our creative industries, so you can gain that unfair advantage as you build out the future of your career. This season, we're focusing on music creators and providing strategic tools that help them navigate this often disrupted industry as they take control of their future. All right, now let's jump into the episode. But also, I think kind of just receiving this information as a gift and figuring Mm -hmm. out the way to to extract it, to share, to make it a more tangible language. I think people are, are just so fixated on just living in the past instead of bringing the past forward and like really like reimagining okay the stuff that we are making is just a derivative of the past it's just your approach on like how you want to do it different you're hearing from r&b singer bosco in addition to her musical talents she's a multidisciplinary designer and the founder of slug global an independent label and creative consultancy. So we asked her to join us on the show because she's already a futurist in her own right. Yes. I was doing my research, right? Yeah, I was doing my research. And in a previous <laughs> interview, she noted, I almost feel like I have some kind of psychic powers. And her latest album, which we'll delve into that a little bit here, Someday This Will All Make Sense, it really serves as a bit of a metaphor for futurist thinking and specifically from like a, an emotional or an artistic lens. And I I mean, I cannot express how excited we are to finally um, have Bosco on the show. I mean, she is like someone when we were thinking of this, like in the early stages, like Bosco was one of the first people that we've talked that we talked about, like actually including and interviewing for the pod, because she, you know, when we talk about futurism being it being a creator of the future and also putting that music lens on it like bosco checks every single one of those boxes yeah um and so a lot of the folks that we've talked to a lot of the top the a lot of the topics that we've talked about have really been describing bosco and the kind of creator that bosco is even if they didn't know they were uh even though some of them actually were dropping (laughs) bosco's name uh (laughs) verbatim but yeah yeah you know we're we're really just excited because again you know bosco um, she's an R&B singer. Um, that's what a lot of people know her as. Um, but she's really like uh, the artist of the future. Um, and so like this conversation was so dope because we just got to really get a look inside her creative process and see that like she's already applying a lot of the futurist thinking yeah. um, to her work and to her processes and to her communities and experiences that she creates through Slug Global um that and and she she might not even she she doesn't call it that um but she she's applying a lot of those frameworks without even knowing it Mm -hmm. um and so normally we we like to start out each episode with we're all futurists where we're explaining how creatives like you and i are futurists in their own right um but actually the inspiration from this episode that we want to give uh when we say we're all futurists it actually came from something that bosco hipped us to Uh, in preparation for this interview. I saw that you had shared this Bell Hooks quote um, about, uh, I'll just say it. Uh, So Bell Hooks said, to be truly visionary, we have to root our imagination in our concrete reality while simultaneously imagining possibilities beyond that reality. Why did that resonate with you? I think she like intelligently explained preserving nostalgia. And like what that like looks like in our first, for me personally, I think my first um, perspective of like innovation um, and uh, innovation technology, like you said, Gavin, it was like back to the future. It Mm -hmm. it was um, like, like, like cartoons, but she comes from a very like literary, literary, um, background and the best way I can say it still is just bringing the past forward and, and really being like a, like very studious around that and mm-hmm. the different like ideology, 
ideologies of, you know, technology, science, um, and innovation. And she, she stood in between those two things too. I think she stood right at the past and past and present crux and she nailed it with that quote. Yeah. Just echoing what Bosco said there. Bell Hooks really didn't nail it with this quote. It just perfectly encapsulates what we try to do as futurists and what we try to do through this podcast. Um, and just to back things up a little bit, if you're unfamiliar, Bell Hooks was a professor, an activist, a philosopher. Um, most folks know her as a writer. She's an author. Her books and her scholarly articles, they covered love, history, race, mass media, and, and many more topics. You know, she was really, uh, you know, just... Not all over the place, but she had a lot of knowledge and a lot of insights that, that she was able to share and get she, out there. She, she, she was a hyper creative, man. She there we go. Creative. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> she couldn't be boxed into, into any one particular topic or whatever that exactly. was. Yeah. Um, and she really lived out this philosophy in her own creations from the quote. Right. So her book, All About Love, New Visions, it's really just that. It's a visionary look at what love can be for communities and societies and individuals. And this philosophy really perfectly sets up the tool that we're going to use today, which is the Three Horizons Framework. Uh, so we'll go into a little bit more detail as the episode goes on. But essentially, this quote and the tool, they both you know, revolve around grounding yourself in today and what's happened in the past while also imagining what could be tomorrow. Yeah, and I, I just think Bosco is like, you know, the perfect person to take us through this tool. Uh, again, Des will explain a little bit more of what that is later. Um, but, you know, as as Bosco said, in relation to Bell Hooks, um, you know, her her creative fuel and her, her fuel mm -hmm. for innovation when it comes to music and media and content and experiences, um, it's really all rooted in bringing the past forward. And we can really start to see that in the way that Bosco expresses her creative process, which is actually like really uh, futuristic. You mentioned how you, you enjoy or you have gotten into collecting old electronics and especially like these relics from the space age. How has that process of, of you know finding these items, how has that influenced your view of the future? I'm like infatuated with flying. So I've been looking at a lot with like with the Jetsons because I'm like, how can we advance so mm. much with technology and we're still walking? Like, this is like bizarre, you know? <laughs> like we, yeah. we have all of this information and we're still walking. But anyway, I could go on a whole tangent about that. Mostly just like books and like modern ar archival, like magazines, um, not so much like comic books, but just really immersing myself um, with like the research of that thing and everything like around it. I think I've just like for so long been chasing like things with like hard edges and I want to kind of like, um, like ease my lines like graphically. And I really love the approach of like the circular curvature um, architecture language within that like wheelhouse, um, you know, aside from like the Bauhaus movement. For me, I was like really into Austin Powers and I was, I found the, um, the DVD. So I've been watching it on like my G3 right here. This one right here. I've been oh, watching wow. Austin Powers on that. And it's what been like super, like super uh, like interesting, but also um, the stories that these pieces carry and like how you acquired them. I'm more interested in like how these objects got to me versus like, oh my God, this is a really cool Mac. Yeah, but it's like the story of going, it's like some Atlanta shit. I met this man at a trailer, like in the woods to get like one of these computers because they're like really like old engineers and computer software nerds that have like croaked out and they're just like I'm going to the woods, all over the woods and I'm just eating rooted vegetables and kombucha you know and then this <laughs> these are like the collectors these are like the people who are like pushing the past forward um, but also I think um, kind of just receiving this information as a gift and figuring mm -hmm. out the way to a to extract it, to share, to make it a more tangible language. I think people are, are just so fixated on just living in the past instead of bringing the past forward and like really ch like reimagining, okay, the stuff that we are making is just a derivative of the past. It's just your approach on like how you want to do it different. 
Yeah, I, I love, um, you know, after knowing Bosco for years and just following her career and just, you know, being around her in, in, in different, you know, events and, you know, just different, different places, different circumstances. It's so awesome to just get like an insight in, into her, right? Just to get into um, her mind a little bit more. And, you know, for, for those who like, who um, don't live in Atlanta or <laughs> LA or like, you know, just haven't really been around Bosco, like, you know, like Bosco is just like really dope, just like, for, you know, like the way she dresses and mm -hmm. um, just the way that she like presents herself. And I think people probably just think that's just because like she's she's just cool, which like she's she's definitely cool. But I think, you know, after he hearing that explanation of like her inspirations and how she she sees the world and how she views the past, um you know her like the way that she presents herself and the way that she she comes off to everybody is like uh, almost like as a result of like her studying like really studying mm. the past and like considering like all of these insights and these memories as gifts right like really like being a steward almost like of the past like being a good steward of the past she's not just being fixated on the past or almost like as an aesthetic but mm -hmm. she's instead uh, foc focused on bringing that past forward. Um, and so I, I, th I think that that is just like really awesome and just like shows a little bit of like her expression of futurism. It's actually yeah. through like going back in the past and archiving. And, you know, we, we spoke about this in previous episode with Octavia E. Butler and how you can archive in the past to create something new for the future. And, and we're getting like a real look at, at what that looks like in the present. Um, and so, I, yeah, I just, I just think it's really dope because, you know, Bosco's creative expression it's it's she's basically saying that you can reimagine the past as a way to bring us to the future and so I think in that way we can almost take like a, a note from like um uh fashion designers and and people who upcycle um yeah. and and just you know or just the concept of of recycling um and to say that like you know the the future might not be all about people who are able to create net new things but people who are able to curate new things and experiences using things from the past mm -hmm. and i think bosco is is such a great example of how curation is kind of the new creation um yeah. and that's something that i've i've been thinking about uh quite a bit and and you know i think i think the perfect um sort of like, you know, case study or uh, proof of concept mm -hmm. for, uh, you know, this, this, these insights that we're talking about, especially when it comes to Bosco, is um, when you look at, when you look into the meaning of her album, Someday This Will All Make Sense, uh, which I think, again, is such a great summation of everything that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And what we found as we talked to her and you know dug into this a little bit was that the album title was really about discovering the different kinds of artists that she can be. And after going through this process, now she knows. I actually named that project before I knew the pandemic was going to happen. For a large part of my career before being a multi-hyphen and a multidisciplinarian like was a thing and was champion and before it was celebrated, you know, you were like, oh, they don't know what they want to do. Oh, they're all over the place. Oh, oh, so what, so what do, like, what do they do? You know, this was like, like, you know, like doing that time, the things like the different type of artists that you could be, are you a touring artist? Are you a singing artist? Are you a recording artist? Are, are you a songwriter? Are you like, like a vibe curator where, you know, people will bring certain people in rooms just because they inspire them to like write and what's the energy like around that. And um, I think I found my, my niche, you know, um, I'm like more of a festival girl and shows and saints, you know, I'm, I'm a nester. I like coziness. I like to be around my people that I trust you know, being out in the world, you know, like can really get on me, a person like me, because I, I, um, I'm an empath, so I take on everything. So I was like, oh, I don't have to do it this way. I could do it this way. Oh, this is lit. Oh, I could be an artist and do like put stuff on like shows, and then like 
do my own live shows when I want to, oh, sign me up, you know, sign me up for that. But it's always, I think artists, they always are um, the first perspective of an artist is always front facing. And I think, um, you know, you really don't know about the other, like um, the other like careers in music. It's, you just don't have that education, just like a, somebody who wants to go to art school, but they didn't know that art direction and branding was was what it was. They called it marketing. Or if you were black and you were like left or center, you do fashion. You know, we didn't really know all of these different like tiers and career paths and career fields. Um, and I think with the education and the internet and all these social apps, um, it's easier to identify who you want to be and then what type of artist you want to be now because we have those tools. Mm. Mm. So it does feel like it's it's all starting to make sense. <laughs> yeah. Man, I think Bosco here is really just speaking to the soul of the current day creator. Yeah. Um, when she talks about like being, you know, not really knowing the full scope and the full landscape of what's out there and where you can plug in mm -hmm. um, and, and not, you know, not knowing how you fit into the broader landscape. I think as creators, we can all sort of fit into that. I can definitely speak, speak to that, you know, yeah. um, from, you know, just how I had to get into this like creative industry, you know, I had to go through the back door as a content creator and, and, and different things that way. So just, I just love her sort of like just putting some, some language, um, around that and a full album to that, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and I, I just love that her going back and learning about, her past um, and and what's important to her helped her imagine a better future for other artists where now she has an agency and she's able to rep creators in a different way, in a way that is more edifying, in a way that's more dignifying, um, yeah. in a way that's a little bit more natural for those creators. So, so I think Bosco is showing here that if you're able to bring your past forward, it helps you reimagine the future for others. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And really just kind of like bigger picture here, this whole sense making thing that seems to be the theme as the title of our album, this sense making aspect of futures thinking, it really offers artists the clarity that they need to succeed. You know, this is just go, go, go yeah. sometimes. But when you start to slow it down, look to the past or just kind of do these sense making exercises, it really, it really just gives you that insight that you need to how to navigate going forward. And, and is sense making an actual like term or tool when it comes to like futurism and strategic foresight? Yeah, it's a term. It, it goes more into strategy. It's like it's not unique to foresight work. Just sense making okay. is where, hey, I have a ton of data or there's a lot of uncertainty out into the market. So there's different things that I might do in my sense making process, which is, okay, okay. you know, looking at how have companies yeah. or individuals dealt with this in the past or looking yeah. at what is the data of today tell me? What are the trends doing? And how do we make sense about that? That, that type of thing. Yeah, man, that's that's why I love this experiment that we're doing together, man. Because, like, you know, I think, like, there's other ways to sense make, you know? And that's not even a term yeah. that I'm familiar with or know. But so, something that is so crucial and something that can be done creatively, as Bosco has proven with this album. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it really just lines up so perfectly. You know, her album, Someday This Will All Make Sense, is just a perfect theme for the podcast and really what we do as yeah. futurists. While the future is always, it's always going to be uncertain, right? Uh, but we can use various frameworks or tools and it just helps us to make sense of it. And then we start to you know plot a course of action. Uh, yes, so that that, that brings me right into the tool that we're going to be using today, which we kind of hinted at earlier on. Uh, so that is the Three Horizons Framework. It is a tool that helps us to map out the phases of change for a particular uncertainty, right? So it involves exploring the status quo that we're maintaining today and kind of looking back a little bit. And then from there, you're looking at the emerging changes or the trends that will disrupt it in the medium term. And then you're thinking about the complete transformations that are gonna play out in the long term. So this tool is most useful in deciding steps that you need to take today and in the near term so that you can reach your long-term destination. That may not have made sense to everyone because some folks are visual learners and that's cool too. 
Uh, so hopefully you're you're watching the video feed of this. I can describe it visually. Yes. So Horizon One, it starts off you know here at the bottom, right? And this is what we've got going on here. This is what matters right now. This is what's valuable today. And then you move up a little bit and over to the side, and then that brings you to this middle section, which is Horizon Two, right? Uh, and then Horizon Two. Right now, it may not be the most important thing, but you can start to see where it's relevant and how it's going to be relevant in the near future. And then you move all the way over to Horizon 3, right? And right now, there aren't very many signals of what Horizon 3 entails, but we know that that's what we're working toward and what will be you know, those paradigm shifting things that we'll be experiencing in the future. And that typically is about five plus years out into the future. Okay, cool. So we're starting at the here and now, we're looking at yeah. signals in the here and now, then we're going to like, what are some things that right now we can see as the near future um, right. and then going forward into like what would be even further into the future so that we can start to sort of like you know l look and gain insights on on where we should be pushing where we should be innovating right exactly exactly and you know okay. our conversation with Bosco was really centered around this tool and her experiences uh, as a creator as a music creator uh, so just, you know, again, the horizon one is the world as we know it or she knows it now. Uh, this is all about the systems we want to sustain or maintain or maybe even exploit as best we can. So here's what Bosco had to say about horizon one of the music industry. We'll kick things off just kind of thinking about today. Um, uh -huh. And if you were to assess not just your career, but the industry at large to you, what's the current state of the music industry? What are music creators experiencing and dealing with right now? What's the most important things that they're experiencing? Um, shelf life um, mm. and the anxiety around con content versus art um, and like, like knowing where to stand in that. Um, I think it's a lot of tension around like those two, like two things. Um, and I, and I think if like we don't like address that, it could it could kind of go the other way. And when you when you say content versus art, are you are you speaking of like that tension of like you know, let's say artists, right? Like mm -hmm. music art, like artists, they want to make art, i.e., they yeah. want to make music, yeah. they want to make. But yeah. then there's the side of like, okay, well then how am I going to make this pop on TikTok, right? Which is the yeah. content part of it. Is mm -hmm. that the kind mm -hmm. of like mm -hmm. you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. And and having the proper time to to still be like well-versed in the creativity and the, and the magic of that. Because you might be 80% finished with an album, but if you're trying to like meet like festival season, it's like that 20% where it's like, all right, do I just hurry up and finish this song? Or do we like, wait, like SZA has made us done, but the caliber of work, the songwriting, the the discipline that it took for her to, she just dropped three singles and they sound like full albums. Like when your single sounds like an album, you, you've like ascended to like another level. And that's what I mean, like, I'm sure at times she might have wanted to sacrifice her art for content, but mm. this is a great example of like, y'all gonna get this art. It took five years, but y'all gonna eat it up, and it's gonna be good because I took my time. So, I'm I'm yeah. I'm happy for her. I'm happy that she was able to do that. For sure. And then, and 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 then expanding on that point a little bit, what do music creators? Um, take for granted when they're making decisions uh, about their careers? Freedom. Freedom. Mm -hmm. I think we take the things we co are complaining about are essentially like not the worst. Like we're not homeless. We're not cold. We're not hungry. We're not starving. You know, like we pretty much like have a good, <laughs> a good, a good life. But I would say, yes, is the freedom, the freedom to get up and go to the studio and be like, you know what, I'm going to make a song today. You know, the freedom to decide, you know, this is what I want to do. And most people don't have that luxury 
And I even have to check myself sometimes. I'm just like, I can get up at most. I mean, at best, I can get up, go to my studio and, and create something. You know, it doesn't always have to be for a financial value, but just having a creative freedom in the brain space and a brain real, real estate to just exist. And I think that's what we take the most for granted. Mm -hmm. And then do, do you even think like going beyond that, like there are maybe some artists or music creators that don't like that don't have that freedom because like maybe they're either like signed they've signed some of their you know rights away or they're they've signed some of their autonomy away whether it be to a label or to like you know some distribution or company just, like whatever it may be or just not having the funds to stay in the studio long enough for the ideas to come I, yeah, like that could also be a thing. I, I can remember being that artist where it's like, I want six hours, but I have to force my creativity within this very like limiting stuffy box. That's, that's one thing I learned about just being creative. It's more about like the process of opening, the process of like willing yourself to it for it to come and not like trying to like force the ideas out, you know? I'm I'm in that space, like just really trying to work on that muscle, the opening, the yielding muscle, you know, mm -hmm. massaging that, working that out. Cause sometimes we want, I'm a Capricorn, so we like when we want to do something, our mind is like, do it. But if you're not yielding to the process and the mistakes and the victory laps and the joys, you're really not gonna appreciate the outcome. And that's what I'm learning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we hit on this a little bit earlier about uh, your collecting of these like old tech items. What music tech relics or what what items uh, of, of music tech from the past are most influential in the present? And maybe it's you know, you're thinking of something like the iPod or even like a website or a service. Like what are some of these things uh, from music's past that are just like really got a choke hold on today? Um, I'm really appreciating the hi-fi, lo-fi movement right now. Um, not as the, not in the perspective of sampling and taking of the record, but more so exploring the soundscapes and textures of records and the authenticity of the sound quality of things versus just like frequency and compression. Um, I, I think they're doing like a, a really like good job of um educating people but also just just using a whole different thought process of like take like taking the appreciation and anatomy of a record and not just be like oh yeah this is cool like whatever streaming i'm seeing honestly maybe it's just in my world i see less streaming happening i noticed don't just trust me okay people are really going to start getting back into tapes, CDs, and vinyls, because the hi-fi, lo-fi movement is really coming from, you know, overseas and just sweeping over here right now, and I'm so stoked about it, so excited about it. Well, can you describe the hi-fi, lo-fi movement? I I think I, I know what you're talking about, but I, uh -huh. I don't, um, but like exactly, because like obviously hi-fi, we're talking about you know, high fidelity, so like vinyl and and, mm -hmm. and tape and, you know, like mm -hmm. even CD and stuff like that. But then what's what's the lo-fi part of it? More like the 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 tapes. So you'll have mm -hmm. like a Kai, um, you'll have like the I can't think of the other brand, these like consoles of listening to the music it the music on those frequencies. And then you have the more lo-fi, which is like the Panasonics, the Sony's. Um, the things like that. So the more like uh, European, uh, Asia influence is more hi-fi. Then you have the Americanized thing, you know, the Americanized um, uh, retro audio hardware, like players and stuff like that. Um, even I saw a really great hi-fi system at Little Trouble. Um, I don't know if you've been there recently, but they have a good little setup that's happening there. And then I know Key is opening a hi-fi bar and I'm 
Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, two, I think it's two bedroom or two console bedroom. So she's black owned, queer, black queer woman. It's open in a high five bar, and I think that's gonna be really tight. Okay, cool. So yeah, that she gave us a lot there for Horizon One to sort of like figure out and chart w- where we are exactly now in the here and now for for H one, mm-hmm. um, and and the the first insight that kind of locates us in in this horizon to start is this um, current anxiety that artists are feeling around yeah. content versus art. And it, and, it, and it almost like the way that Bosco describes it is also is almost like musicians feel that becoming a, a, a creator or a, like a content creator and, and making content is sacrificing their artistic integrity. So, uh, you know, it's mm-hmm. like in, in the here and now, music artists are feeling an anxiety about becoming a music creator. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's really interesting coming from the creator side of things, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting, too, because it's like one, you know, one theory, one thought is like the music industry will increasingly reflect content talent as opposed to music yeah. talent. Right. So yeah. there's less of like, wow, this person is an incredible guitarist or songwriter or just vocal talent is phenomenal. And more so, oh, man, like they write things that are the caption to my social media experience or they make you know instrumentations or 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 song or sounds that like perfectly encapsulate the the mood of of this video that i captured you know yeah and then i think this also explains why that like we're increasingly seeing music designed for algorithms instead of you know for audiences so and and not only you know fringe artists or um flavor of the month artists like you know these are the 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 drakes um yeah. who are coming with these like caption ready lyrics or you know these um you know these these songs that can be summed up into like four to eight bars to be used in a tiktok or in an instagram caption or you know even like a meme uh, a memeable video you know what i yeah. mean um I, I think that really describes like what we're seeing now from artists I love how we're starting to connect all of these bridges between um, our our past episodes, you know, so like if you haven't listened to our episode with Marcus Hollinger yet, um, you know, going back and and hearing him talk about how the future is creator, you know, so Mm. it's not about it's not about necessarily selling out. It's about viewing yourself um, as more than simply a musician, but as a creator that uses music as their main medium, but is able to be more of a creator, which allows you access into different industries and different mm-hmm. mediums. Yeah. So if you would say the future is creator or we're moving into this space where everyone becomes a multi-hyphenate creator, even if they have their one specific thing that's yeah. their biggest talent, what, how would you characterize that where it's like that singular focus, maybe the, the, the status quo of today? How would you describe that? I would probably describe that more as like specialized artistry, right? Mm-hmm. Where specialized artistry are your singers, your rappers, your producers, your music video guys or your your um your camera guys right that's what most artists call their videographers yeah did they call you a camera guy back in the day you know, hey you know, <laughs> whatever you know well, well anyways um, artists are sort of uh, more specialized right yeah um and and i think that that is what is starting to change yeah yeah and i think going back to what bosco was saying about artists take for granted like the freedom of of being a creator and maybe as you loosen uh those boundaries and start to think of yourself as as this multi-hyphenate that there's a lot of freedom that comes from that you don't have to be locked into one particular thing you can just experience what that's like to to do all these other types of creations that that's definitely the next thing that i heard in talking about horizon one where we are now is once you move past the anxiety you get to the freedom of embracing the transition to creator and just like you said there's a there's a lot of freedom that comes from being a creator and really just yielding to the process 
So when you're in this realm of specialized artistry, there's a lot that you hold on to of, you know, I I need to make sure I am sort of like uh, the best in this particular field when it comes to this specialized art form um, that doesn't really allow you to yield to the process. Sometimes it's less about being the best singer or the best rapper and, and it's about being the best collaborator and and be the freedom to embrace all of what makes you 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 know like i love when i see um you know artists ver- uh, verge into different lanes right you like t-pain and his like have you seen t-pain's uh uh twitch channel like I, have you seen his show and like the I've intros that he makes for his shows i've seen he, clips but i haven't watched much of it Okay, so just, like, go on, you could go on Twitch, right, and, like, view a full show, or just, like, go on, you know, uh, go on, like, you know, YouTube or Twitter or whatever, where people are, like, sharing these clips of, like, these crazy intros that he has for his his Twitch show. Mm -hmm. They sound better than, like, and I love T-Pain, incredible artist, but, but, like, he's, like, upping his his level as, like, a, 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 a singer, rapper, yeah. With these, with these, tw- as a Twitch streamer, you know what I mean. So it's like, is you you have the freedom now where like, you know, people would think of Twitch streamers as like only gamers or only you know whatever it may be. But he has the freedom yeah. to now go into Twitch and make his own variety show of sorts and mm-hmm. continue to still make music. But is now it's just a new avenue for his music, and it's yeah. insane if you if y'all yeah. go and listen to it. So yeah. I so I so I think the freedom piece is is definitely something that artists here and now are starting to embrace that kind of relates back to what bosco was saying as well where you know so many people now if you think about music it's all about streaming like how many streams do you have or, yeah, you know, yeah yeah are you trending on spotify or whatever but she talked about this kind of lo-fi hi-fi movement it's like hey maybe that's not the end all be all maybe instead of getting like a fraction of a penny for these streams, like maybe you focus in on some of these other ways of, of getting your content out there. And, you know, maybe it's, it's going back to your know, actual CDs and albums and vinyls and record record sales or other yeah. other ways to just get it out. When you're in this realm of specialized artistry, you're considering yeah. yourself a specialized musician, creating a specialized art form. You are essentially contributing to the siloing of your product your creative yeah. product yeah. um and essentially you know the the siloing will lead to the commoditization of it mm-hmm. and so i think what specialized artists viewing themselves as creators can do can just help unbox them yeah. <laughs> right or unchain <laughs> it, it yeah. can it can help unchain them um from those from those silos um and really start to uh, create another level of like experience and education and intentionality and community around their art. Yeah, yeah. So just to summarize everything, because we, we've we've covered a lot of ground here on Horizon One, uh, but to take a step back, Horizon mm-hmm. One, when you're using this three horizon framework, it's all about sustaining the status quo. Right. And it's, you know, yeah. maintaining whatever you got going on. So for music creators, that means specialized artistry, meaning a focus on singularly just making songs, doing the guest appearances or creating albums. And of course, this is what people dream about when it comes to being a professional musician. Uh, but it's a dream that is waning in feasibility. Artists are increasingly struggling just to make a living off their music alone. So, you know, that status quo, frankly, isn't going to work. And that is always the case, right? When you're looking at Mm -hmm. these types of exercises and forecasting out the change, the status quo just doesn't remain the status quo forever. It's it's always going to change. And that's what brings us into Horizon 2. It's often a transitionary period, or some people might call it the messy middle of a particular topic. So one of the key emerging trends that Bosco identified for Horizon 2 is the vulnerability of record labels. Talk about like how the industry is going to change. What aspects of the music industry right now are most vulnerable to those changes? Like what business models or what ways that people are thinking about music is like, oh no, that's that's not gonna fly in this in this vision that you have. <laughs> honestly think like we're really on the last days of like um label structure deals i think we've already kind of seen the the point of change in that within the last four years 
um, and having artists like really consider their masters, you know, um, they, there are like companies out there that allows artists to keep their masters, but at a contingency of a lesser signing fee or bonus fee or something like that, which is cool. Um, but also maybe lowering the mastering rights, you know, not having the master so long um, where it just feels like um, more of a partnership investment. Like this is a great piece to put in my portfolio, but not like owning a person, you know, like this is a business deal, but it's not like your whole life, you know, yeah. oh, you can have my master's for like 10 years, you know, stuff like that, I think you know, we, we should really um, consider, because that's still like a, a pain point in the industry is like really controlling your masters and knowing how your masters are being used. What are the roles, what are the skill sets that people can acquire now that will help them prepare for that type of future for the music industry? Working closely with product designers, I think production designers um, and industrial designers. Um, architects will be will be great but like learning how to actually do the renders the 3d models and stuff like that um and having these things in your hand to actually see how to make things um that's something that i specifically want to move into um so i can have those conversations and also the vernacular to actually explain my idea and speak the language of that like discipline i think each each category has its own set of rules and its own language and um, knowing how to like get around that and talk around it, I think it will be very beneficial. Okay, so Horizon 2 and we're looking three to five years in the future, right? Yep. Like so yep. three, three to five years into the near future. Um, you know, I don't think it's surprising to hear that you know what we see as like the the big change to get us to the the more distant future yeah. is the changing of label structures yeah yeah and as she really sparked something when when she started talking about that and the vulnerability of, of the current label structure it really got us to thinking okay well if the label structures as we know it the status quo uh is vulnerable mm -hmm. What might it mm -hmm. look like in the future, right? So, you know, Gav and I were kind of talking back and forth, a couple of different models. Uh, so one thing, going back to, we were just talking about Twitch, right? What if labels all got acquired by social networks or other content mm. entities going forward, right? What, what would that look like and how would that change the way that content is created, that artists are promoted, that yeah. people engage with the content? So that's one concept, right? Everything under this social media umbrella. Then the other thing we talked about was what if fans start to own mm. the labels themselves, right? And that might sound yeah. crazy, uh, but you know, it's starting to pick up with these decentralized, uh, what is it, the DAOs, the decentralized autonomous organizations yeah. on, on blockchain type of stuff. Uh, but it's also yeah. got like, there's references to this out in the market now. A lot of people may not know this, but the Green Bay Packers of the NFL, they are owned by the fans. Like the fans all have like a whatever, uh, certificates to show like whatever tiny percent of the team that they own like that is a fan owned uh, group which is why you might think oh it's such a successful team why are they in this small town Green Bay because they're owned by the town they're owned by the people that live there yeah and you know so you say like where we may be going but actually there are signs of this already and oh. um, yeah so there, there are signs of this already with meta labels um mm. and so i've been really interested in the formation of meta labels you mentioned DAOs earlier mm -hmm. meta labels uh feels like almost a more casual more uh creatively liquid version of of a DAO, where we're not we're not trying to replace you know centralized organizations with decentralized yeah. ones we are we're really like re reimagining what a label looks like and so a lot of times when we think of label we think of like a, a record label and i think that's a good way to think about what a meta label is and so meta labels were actually started by the founder of kickstarter and so you think about kickstarter and what that meant for 
um, creators uh, of all kinds, but definitely musicians to start. What a meta label is, is a release club. So think of it as like a, a release club where groups of people who share the same interests drop and support work together. Mm-hmm. So it's a lightweight structure that creates economic, emotional, and creative alignment between creators. So I know that can be a little bit you know, vague or like hard to grasp at exactly like what is a meta label, but again, just think about people coming together over a shared passion, pooling yeah. their skills, pooling some resources, um, and pooling their audiences to drop things. So, you know, this could be dropping a zine, a book, an album, um, mm. a product of some sort. Um, and so thinking of, you know, where where have I seen this in real life? Um, if anybody remembers Lil Nas X and the controversial, like, Satan sneakers or whatever they were <laughs> called, that actually was a product of a meta label called Mischief. Um, and there's also a book uh, that I'll speak about a little bit later called After the Creator Economy that speak about, you know, again, just like what's coming after the creator economy and that zine and everything that has come with, uh, that has come with it um, is the product of a meta label, people coming together for a certain period of time to mm. drop an intentional uh, creative artifact. Mm. Very interesting. Um yeah, I definitely got to check that book out and just read more into it. This sounds like a really just compelling use case and something that really could, you know, change the game up, whether it's in music yeah. or any other facet. Yeah, 100 percent. And, you know, just speaking about freedom again in, in H1, what mm-hmm. that will provide us in H2 is the um, is the ability to actually create a lot more of these more um, liquid label structures uh, or these meta labels. Right. So if you are not a specialized musician you do mm-hmm. not have to subject yourself to a traditional label deal which allows you to create labels or or uh, labels or collaborations where before you might have been constricted from doing so before yeah. so again we see that freedom in the now affecting where we are going to end up going in the next three to five years yeah. Um, and then also, you know, speaking about the next three to five years, something else that we talked about um, with with Bosco was how the the new skill sets that people uh, can learn today to to help set them up for the next three to five years. And we talked about uh, a, a lot of things that are kind of like tangible, right? Linking with product designers, learning mm-hmm. a skill. Mm -hmm. learning how to essentially like make things with your hands right um like learning to make things is going to give you a vernacular and a skill set to really articulate your ideas for the future so that when you're going into these places where maybe you're creating some sort of uh company with a product designer or you know Mm -hmm. somebody that you wouldn't have thought you would have collaborated before you now have the vernacular to be able to communicate your idea where you're not just you know it's not just about the vibes. It's not just about, uh, you know, the, the lyrics or whatever. Like you are talking to uh, this person with a vernacular and a skill set that really makes sense for your collaboration. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, so as we think back on everything we've covered here on Horizon 2, you know, just in summary, Horizon 2 is all about disruptive trends and how they change the way that things were in Horizon 1. So this is a point where it's critical to identify opportunities that change the scope of what is possible. And really, given how the music industry has been disrupted time and time again, there's always a number of such opportunities that are starting to emerge as long as you're an innovative thinker. So the biggest area of disruption that we see emerging for Horizon 2 in the music industry is the reimagining of record labels. Now, of course, that's going to come with entirely new job skills or ways of doing business around that. But that's really the key right there. These you know, record labels have to be completely reimagined, and that could be you know, who owns it, the types of companies they're involved with, or the ways the different artists partner with one another. So that brings us to Horizon 3. This is where reinvention and you know, just complete paradigm shifts happen. By the time this era arrives, entirely new ways of thinking or operating will have started to emerge. So we asked Bosco what she thought that Horizon 3 would look like for her own company, Slug Global. What is the most important change taking place in the music industry that's going to start to help us flesh out the future um sexuality uh, fluidity 
I think mm. that since, you know, we have really opened, you know, a broadening the scope of like preference and pronouns and creating a safe space for, you know, mass film, film mass, like to really embrace the androgyny lens and whatever like scope or scale or side of it that you wanna go on, I would say that that has been able to um, really like offer some creative music um, mm. because it's more of a freedom to like fully express themselves versus like having to shut off a fraction of who they are to appease, mm -hmm. you know, a group. Like I think we are having very unique offerings uh, with these projects and stuff that's coming out musically and visually. I think they're both like, you know, complementing one another and speaking to each other well. Even zooming out of the sort of like fluidity and like, is it even more about just like identity and how people sort of are feeling the freedom to like identify mm -hmm. nowadays, mm -hmm. like be into, mm -hmm. just be into so many different yeah. things. It seems like. Yeah. 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 A abso absolutely. I'm going to put on my historia hat real quick. It's, it's interesting as we're kind of getting in this space, talking about the multidisciplinarians and, you know, they always say like, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. So we go through these cycles mm -hmm. and I think back to even if you're thinking of like a da Vinci or a Benjamin Franklin, these were people that were known as Renaissance men. They were scientists, they were artists, mm -hmm. they were philosophers, statesmen at times. They had all these different lanes, all these different talents. And you know they're regarded, highly regarded for that. Mm -hmm. Then we get into this space brought upon by, you know, industrial revolution, brought upon by mm -hmm. Henry Ford and his innovations of the assembly line. And what happens mm -hmm. is you are no longer looked at for the totality of your mm -hmm. humanness. Now with the assembly line, it's like, you're the person that puts the doors on the car and you get really good at putting <laughs> the doors on the car. That's what you do. Like not brakes. No, that's not, I don't make cars. I put doors on cars and that, you know, was a lane and that permeated all throughout society. Even so, if you look at like sports, it was like, hey, I'm a point guard. That's it. Like, that's my yeah. focus. I'm a point. Okay. I'm a shooting guard. My thing, I'm really good at shooting. I'm not passing other people. Like, I'm really good at shooting. And then as we get to like kind of thinking about work, it's like, oh, like, Brittany, what do you mean? Like, you sing and songwrite and you do graphic design? Like, no, pick one because that's how society works. Now we're finally getting to that space where whether it's you, Bosco, and you're able to be a film director on Monday. And then, wow. you know, a concert organizer on Tuesday. And then, you know, your own artist, you know, a musician writing songs on Wednesday. Like it just, it varies. Or if we look at like sports and like so many guys now, they can play multiple positions. Uh -huh. You know, Gab, you being a creative director, you're able to bounce around and do, you know, wear so many hats. Like that's, yeah. that's regarded now. So it's just interesting to see we're, we're rolling back into that, that Renaissance person uh, time period. <laughs> It kind of rem reminds me of um, the Bajas movement, where they had all of these people, all these disciplines under one wheelhouse, and then mm. eventually you, some of those skill sets kind of rubbed off, you know, kind of rubbed off on you. Kind of feels like like a new ushering in of that like thought process, that ethos, and that like community of just multi hyphenate disciplines. But I'm um, also really appreciating. Um, the technology, you know, perspective, but through the science lens, you know, I think uh, technology, you go on science or mm, yeah. you know, engineering, I'm on the science end of things and human behavior and like what happens when you put people around these objects and things like what, what's, what's the communication styles? Like I'm, I'm trying to like definitely go there with it, you yeah. know, as, yeah. as far as using, using objects or, um, these collectibles is also like studying human behavior. Like, does it inspire like mental health? Does it does mm -hmm. it like trigger some type of memories that maybe this thing is attached to my mother who maybe transitioned when I was fourteen? You know, like really starting to kind of really push push what that looks like too. What uh, what is Slug Global in ten years? 
Um, and then how, like, how are you going to be serving your clients and artists in, in 2030? Um, 10 years, I think we would have fully transitioned from agency to partnerships. Um, you specifically come, you know, to us for an idea to collaborate on together, um, less on services. Um, I see us going into product design. So like our merch, um, you know, our skate fest, things that we wanna do uh, for the community. Um, I also see blog, <clears throat> so maybe like a publication as well, extracted from that. Um, but mostly just Slug Global, the brand. So conferences, activations, merch, product design, e-commerce, uh, Slug TV, Slug Radio, you know, that type of thing. Yeah, Slug Records. Okay. Kind of just have our own, like, golf. Creative fluidity. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think I've really had the language to like really speak to that before now yeah. but creative fluidity i i totally like see where bosco is going with this as the change that is going to get us to five years in the future in horizon three um bosco started off by talking about more of like a a, a sexual flu fluidity um but you know i think that just speaks to a broader fluidity of identity that is yeah. going to help change the landscape. Um, so, you know, and, and identity, and we started off the episode talking about this, but the identity or, or like what as a creator or as a person, uh, your identity is acceptable to be. Are you, mm -hmm. ex are you accepted to be these different kinds of things that may contradict one another um, from day to day or moment to moment? Yeah. Um, and it just made me think about how we are really sort of like living in a new renaissance. And I, I wrote an article a few years ago now um, that was really just about like the renaissance of the renaissance man. And like, you know, how uh, and Des, you spoke to this a little bit, but how, mm -hmm. you know, the Benjamin Franklins and the Da Vinci's of the world were like regarded for. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're being a jack of all trade um, and being a multi hyphenate, um, uh, being a multi hyphenate in their skill set, but also in their interests. Um, and, you know, but then we went from that to specialization. And I think that 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 doesn't just have like an effect on, you know, careers and uh, things like that and, and industries and things like that. But I think it also has an effect on identity and what we're accepted as what our parents expect us to be expect mm -hmm. us to behave how they expect us to identify and i do believe that we are squarely now in a place where we're again rewarding people for having multi-hyphenate interests multi-hyphenate yeah. skill set multi-hyphenate lives um so so i think we need to like five years in the future as creators we need to see ourselves as fluid uh, from moment to moment, opportunity to opportunity, we present ourselves as something different. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's 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 not an entirely new premise. Right. Some of the most forward looking artists of the past have been doing that already. If you look at someone yeah. like Prince, who multi hyphenate in terms of he played every instrument and was a virtuoso on all of them and was also a fantastic singer and songwriter. But then in identity and expression, right? He could you know, write a song from his perspective. He could write a song from the perspective of a woman and then sing it or, you know, pass that on to other artists as well. And then expanding the scope of being a multi-hyphenate. It wasn't just the music. Then he's, you know, writing and directing movies and producing movies as well. And then, you know, the entire like early e-com and like internet communities within the music industry that was him. He was the pioneer that was doing those sorts of things as well. So, you know, that serves as an example or an icon of, you know, how these creators now yeah. can, you know, move in these different spaces. Or even if you take a step back and look at other industries, if you look at a company like Amazon and how their identity is so many different things to different people. You know, to some people, yeah, exactly. these are the folks that I'm able to shop with and they're able to deliver my goods within two days. To some people, yeah. it's 
hey, this is the company that I get my cloud computing services from and it exactly. helps my whole digital operation to, to work out. Other people still, it's like, oh, this is the company that has my favorite TV shows and a couple of my favorite movies exactly. on Amazon Prime. Could, could, or- could you... Could- could you imagine if like Amazon was like, nah, I'm only selling books like that's forever. It. That's it. like, that's like, it's crazy to think about that from an industry and a company perspective. Yeah. So why would you then take that same position, you know, yeah. as, as an individual creator? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, going back to that, it's all about what did they learn in selling books that allowed them to expand? So if you're a exactly. music creator or any other type of artist or innovator, what have you learned in this first phase of your career, the current phase of your career that you're really great at now? What have you learned that you can then expand and you exactly. know, branch off into other spaces as well? And yeah, you know, speaking of the future, I think, uh, you know, she really just set a grand vision for us. Uh, Bosco, as she was talking about what she feels like Slug Global is going to be in 10 years and really just emphasizing that partnerships element, yeah. you know? So it's like, you know, it's already futuristic today. So I just thought it was really interesting how she talked through that. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, um, Slug Slug is already like futuristic today. The, the moment she founded Slug, like, you know, people were still trying to like found new new versions of the same old record label yeah uh and she was like this is not going to be a label it's going to be an agency it's going to be uh it's going to be a collective of multi-hyphenate creatives and Mm -hmm. it's really you know in a lot of ways that i've seen them operate shown itself to be like an agency of the future um and and i think that that's what labels and agencies of the future uh will will be like um and, and I love that she sort of like talked about the next frontier of what Slug will be in, in the next 10 years um, and, and it not being around ownership and exploitation. Again, we saw this uh, in Horizon 2 about, yeah. um, you know, labels changing and those structures changing um, oh, and changing and moving away from ownership and exploitation. And, you know, what Bosco painted as a picture for Slug in 10 years being about connection and partnerships. Um, so, you know, connections with product designers, connection with experience makers, connections with media companies. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think that Slug in the future will be a media company um, or even like a, a more of just like a canvas in which to showcase talent, not own it. Mm-hmm. So what what does that look like? You know, if you're if you're you know transforming into into just like a canvas uh, what, is, what does that sound like to you? Like, how, how might that manifest as a company? As we are envisioning what we make more as like, you know, a, a media uh, a media company, a media conglomerate, uh, as you will, I think that creators need to not think of themselves as just creators, but like creator ecosystems. Mm. Like put, put themselves put themselves in a place where, you know, I'm not just, you know, making different kinds of content, right? Like we're starting to see that now into the next three to five years, but in the next five years and beyond, I'm starting to view myself as a creator ecosystem. I have, um, you know, I have deals that I pitch to different brands. Um, You know, I have, uh, I take the different kinds of content that I make, you know, I've, I've opened myself up to make different kinds of content. And now I'm taking those different kinds of content and I'm evolving those into different kinds of deals, into different yeah. kinds of series, into different kinds of assets that I can collaborate with different brands and media outlets and publications on. So I'm going from creator uh, you know, a, a creator operating in the creator economy to a creator building my own ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, this, this could be another space for agencies like Slug or maybe they offer these umbrellas for artists to extend yeah. their music identity into merchandise, into technology, exactly. into different like product opportunities as well. Uh, so this yeah. again, you know, this is this is what Horizon 3 is all about. Horizon 3 is where trends and changes really just coalesce into truly transformative action. So this represents, Mm -hmm. like I was saying, this represents complete paradigm shifts, whole new ways of thinking. And for musicians and really artists in general, we foresee that Horizon 3 will see the rise of the creator ecosystem. 
right? Yep. And the way that we define that is, you know, you as the artist, as the creator, you're at the epicenter of it. And you're not just, you know, blocked into one thing as a, a video maker or a musician, but you're able to take that primary skill set that you have and then reimagine it in other facets, other creative ventures, uh, no matter where that takes you, you know, beyond where you originally started. And also taking all parts of your creative identity and your fluid creative being mm -hmm. um, and saying, you know, how do I imagine myself more, you know, even as like a, a small media company, mm -hmm. um, you know, so again, it might not be something that we're able to do now. It's going to be tough to go straight from, um, you know, touring music photographer to, yeah. cre you know, create creative ecosystem, creator ecosystem. Or, you know, straight from producer to creator ecosystem where now I'm a media company. But that's why we have these three different horizons. Yeah. We start today where we have specialized artistry. We move into the reimagining of record labels, the reimagining of, you know, skill sets and even streaming. And then, you know... Uh, after those three to five years, we get to the place where after we've been reimagining, after we've been living in an environment where all mm -hmm. of these things have been reimagined, we're able to evolve into creator ecosystem. So it's about knowing where we are now in Horizon 1 and developing the skills that are going to help us get to Horizon 3. Yeah, um, absolutely. I was going to do the and, summary, but man, you just you, you locked it in right there. We good to go. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think lastly, I just want to leave us with um, uh, the, this zine that I was talking about before, which is called mm -hmm. After the Creator Economy. So I'll hold it here. I have two cameras. So I'll hold it here. Um, I'll, I'll hold it here as well. I think it might be a little bit blown out. You might not be able to see it. But um, anyway, so this this After the Creator Economy zine, again, um, you know, this comes from a meta label. Um, and we talk the, so that this meta label is meta label and co matter. Uh, the editors are Austin Roby and Severin Matusik. Um, and of course, like a main contributor of this is Yancey Strickler, who um, is a, a, a contributing editor of this meta label and also the founder of Kickstarter. And, you know, this is just talking about where are we going after the creator economy? Um, I will say that, you know, Des and I had this conversation with Bosco and thus all of our insights and even coming up with this idea of creator ecosystem. Obviously, we didn't come up with it, but, you know, we had we had talked about that as being Horizon 3 before I even picked up this book. But I love the synergies because in, you know, in, in this, there is a short interview uh, with Yancey Strickler um, where we're talking about the creator economy and how that really, the, the term creator economy doesn't do justice to the full scope of mm -hmm. what being a creator truly is. And yeah. so when you throw the word economy into things, it focuses everybody on monetization and it doesn't, but it, you know, it doesn't talk about the community building that, um, that uh, being a creator brings. It doesn't talk about the identity of being a creator and something that is more dignifying um, and uh, and more relatable for what uh, being a creator is is moving from describing things as an economy to an ecosystem. So mm -hmm. they asked Yancey in in this article, how should we be thinking about creative practices online instead of an economy as an ecosystem? Um, and Yancey replied, yes, ecosystems. Ecosystems have life, death, sustenance, competition pain, rebirth, all of it. Mm -hmm. This is the truth of creativity in each individual person's practice, as well as the giant space itself. Ecosystem is a far better word. So I, you know, I think in, in wrapping this up, uh, you know, this was just such an incredible conversation with Bosco to plot not only where we are now through the eyes of a creative visionary, but mm -hmm. where will we be in five plus years? Yeah. Um, and I really want us to start looking forward past the creator economy, which is very H1. It's very individual. It's very single player mode, as we were saying before, um, and looking into how do we build ourselves into yeah. creator ecosystems. Yeah. And with that, you know, this has been 
the Tools for Time Traveling podcast, walking you through the Three Horizons framework uh, with a little help from our guest, Bosco, today. Uh, so thanks for checking us out and we look forward to hearing from all of you and how you're using this tool and other tools to map out your creativity and what you do next. Thanks. Yeah. All right. See you soon. Peace. Thank you.